So we've spent two chapters on how carbonyl functional groups can be electrophiles, and this is the one chapter where we're going to see they can be nucleophiles as well, and it really all revolves around the alpha carbon. And it turns out the alpha carbon is a little more acidic than, uh, actually quite a bit more acidic than a regular alkane carbon, and we'll see uh, it's due to resonance here in a second. So let's talk about what alpha means first. Uh, so in this case, your carbonyl carbon is kind of like ground zero. Each adjacent carbon to him is referred to as an alpha carbon, and then any carbon further away from that would be beta, and then gamma, delta, epsilon, so on and so forth. The only ones we really need to worry about in this chapter are alpha and beta, and alpha will definitely be, uh, take the preeminence here. So if we look here at this particular ketone, so on the alpha carbon, there are two alpha hydrons, and as we said, they are a little more acidic than a normal alkane, I, like, I should say actually, again, a lot more acidic than a normal alkane hydrogen uh, due to resonance. If we deprotonate one of these here, and in this case I'll use hydroxide, we'll deprotonate one of these H's, and it doesn't really matter which one. Uh, it'll lead to this anion right here, and this anion is stabilized by resonance. We can dump the electrons here and push them up to the oxygen, and we get these two resonance structures, and the one with the negative charge on the oxygen is the major resonance contributor, and the other the minor resonance contributor. So we also have this other alpha carbon right here, and so we have another possible alpha carbon to deprotonate leading to another possible product. So and in this case, we get these two resonance structures yet again. So this is the minor and this the major. So and in this case, if we take a look at these two resonance structures, and we'll compare the majors, the thing that really uh, is going to affect the stability the most here is how substituted the pi electrons are. And since they're more substituted in this structure right here, this top one, this entire structure is more stable than the bottom one. And you got to realize that we have a name for these structures. They call them enolates. And you can kind of look at them as being like the conjugate base of an enol. So if you recall, we had enols were kind of an alkene and an alcohol at the same carbon here. So, and if you deprotonate this hydrogen, you'd have this major resonance contributor, the enolate, and that's kind of where this name comes from. So when you deprotonate the alpha carbon, the conjugate base is called an enolate. Uh, and in this case, if you have an option, if you have two different alpha carbons and one leads to a more substituted and one leads to a less substituted enolate, the more substituted one is going to be the thermodynamic enolate, and with hydroxide, that's the major one. So, and the less substituted one would be the kinetic enolate, and with hydroxide, that ends up being the minor one. Uh, we'll find out later on what we can favor the kinetic one if we so desire with a bulky base. So now we actually want to compare the acidity of the alpha hydrons of a few different functional groups, and we're actually going to start from the bottom up on this slide, and so we're going to start off with the ester. So and for the ester, the big thing you got to realize here is what is on the other side of the carbonyl here is going to affect the acidity here, and really we should look at it as how it affects the stability of the conjugate base. And in this case, we should realize that this is a very strong electron donating group, and electron donating groups destabilize bases, making the bases stronger. And so if the base is stronger, that's going to make the corresponding conjugate acid weaker. And so uh, of the functional groups we got listed here, ester, ketone, and aldehyde, the ester is the weakest uh, of the acids because it's got the strongest donating group on the other side of the carbonyl. Now if we look at the ketone here, and again at the conjugate base, we're just going to have some sort of alkyl chain here, so a methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, whatever, uh, and in that case, that is a weak donating group. So, and being a weak donating group, it's still going to destabilize the conjugate base here a little bit, just not as much as the ester, and if we destabilize the conjugate base a little bit, it's a stronger conjugate base, meaning it came from a little bit weaker conjugate acid, and so in this case, it's not as weak as the ester, but pK is still around 20, uh, so definitely not the strongest of acids you might think in a traditional sense and stuff, but way stronger than an alkane. And finally, we'll look at the aldehyde here. And for the aldehyde, we just have a hydrogen on the other side of the carbonyl, and a hydrogen is neither electron donating or nor with electron withdrawing here, and so it's not really going to have any kind of donating or withdrawing effect, which means it's though less donating than either of the two we've seen, and if it's less donating, that means the conjugate base here is more stable, this enolate's more stable than the other two enolates we've seen for the ketone and the ester, and that means the corresponding alpha carbons are more acidic. Uh, than either the ketone or the ester, and that's why the pK here is somewhere in the ballpark of 15 for a typical aldehyde. Um, so that's kind of how it works. If you look, what this really means then is that uh, with water having a pKa of around 15, uh, 15 point, you know, 4 or so and some change, that means that hydroxide here is not going to be able to deprotonate an ester to any significant extent. You know, maybe one out of, uh, you know, uh, 100 million molecules or something like that. And for the ketone, same thing, maybe one out of 100,000 molecules. And uh, But for the aldehyde here, notice I, I looked at the, I showed the arrow here differently. For the aldehyde, it's actually going to get deprotonated to some extent, not 100% by any stretch, but not like, you know, it might be one out of two molecules or something like this. 
uh, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. So I put a, a different sort of equilibrium arrow. But if we look at the top one here, so for the top example, I've got an alpha carbon that's not just alpha to one carbonyl, it's alpha to two carbonyls. And as a result, uh, the conjugate base here, the enolate, is not going to stabilize the negative charge just with a single oxygen, but with two oxygens. And that's an, a significant increase in the stability of the conjugate base, making it a much weaker conjugate base, coming therefore from a much con stronger conjugate acid. And the, the pKa here is 9, and so for a beta diketone, that alpha carbon in the center actually uh, will effectively get deprotonated 100%, or 99.99999%. Uh, by hydroxide. So just something to keep in mind. If we want to deprotonate these other functional groups, just a regular aldehyde, a regular ketone, a regular ester, uh, to a greater extent, we're going to have to find a new strong base. Hydroxide is not going to cut it. Now it turns out that that new favorite strong base here is what we call LDA. Uh, and the structure is given right down here below. That is lithium diisopropyl amide. Uh, notice a negative charge on nitrogen is less stable than a negative charge on oxygen. So this thing is a stronger base than hydroxide. It turns out it's quite a bit stronger base than hydroxide. It's also bulky, as we see. Uh, and that'll play a role in just a second as well. So if we take a look at our ketone here, again, we've got alpha hydrogens here. And we've got alpha hydrogens out here. So, And it turns out the more acidic ones are on the right, so, because the more substituted enolate is the more stable one, but with LDA being bulky, if we carry out this deprotonation at low temperatures, so here negative 78 degrees, uh, we'd actually preferentially deprotonate the less substituted side of the ketone, forming the less substituted enolate. So this is the kinetic enolate, and we can favor that kinetic product uh, at low temperatures. That's, again, hence the negative 78 degrees Celsius. But what's nice here is with LDA, we essentially get 100% conversion. I mean, like 99.9999999, you know, effectively 100% conversion of our ketone to an enolate, uh, or of an ester even to an enolate, uh, or of an aldehyde to an enolate. So in this case, hydroxide wouldn't cut it, but LDA works just fine. So it's our new favorite strong base. We got one last little thing to talk about. It's something we've seen in the past, and that's ketoenol tautomerism. So, and in this case, we've got a ketone here, and this ketone has alpha hydrogens both here and here. And so as a result, we got two possible enols we could form, one on either side. And again, these enols look a lot like the enolate with just still the H there and no overall negative formal charge. Uh, and so there's an equilibrium going on here, and most of the time, a ketone is the favored form in the equilibrium by quite a bit. And we'd have a little bit of these enols. And, and again, just like with the enolates, the more substituted enol is the more stable one. But by and large, in this equilibrium, the ketone is still the predominant species. But between the two enols, the one on the left would have a little higher concentration in the solution than the one on the right. Um, cool, so this is ketoenol tautomerism. And this can happen both under acidic conditions or basic conditions. You'd have a little bit of enol present. Uh, and it turns out it's. Uh, usually, you know, kind of a weaker base situation. But in this chapter, we really focus exclusively on how this occurs in acidic conditions. And we'll find out the big deal here is that under basic conditions, the reactions we look at, your nucleophile is going to be an enolate, whereas under acidic conditions, the nucleophile is going to be one of these enols.